A Game of Thrones by author George R. R. Martin Daenerys 10 The land was red and dead and parched, and good wood was hard to come by. Her foragers returned with gnarled cottonwoods, purple brush, sheaves of brown grass. They took the two straightest trees, hacked the limbs and branches from them, skimmed off their bark, and split them, laying the logs in a square. Its center they filled with straw, brush, bark shavings, and bundles of dry grass. But Carl chose a stallion from the small herd that remained to them. He was not the equal of Khal Drogo's red, but few horses were. In the center of the square, Ago fed him with a withered apple and dropped him in an instant with an axe blow between the eyes. Bound hand and foot, Miri Mazdur watched from the dust with disquiet in her black eyes. It is not enough to kill a horse, she told Danny. By itself, the blood is nothing. You don't have the words to make a spell, nor the wisdom to find them. Do you think blood magic is a game for children? You call me magi as if it were a curse, but all it means is wise. You are a child with a child's ignorance. Whatever you mean to do, it will not work. Loose me from these bonds and I will help you. I am tired of the magi's braying, Danny told Jogo. He took his whip to her, and after that the god's wife kept silent. Over the carcass of the horse they built a platform of hewn logs, trunks of smaller trees and limbs from the greater, and the thickest, straightest branches they could find. They laid the wood east to west, from sunrise to sunset. On the platform they piled Khal Drogo's treasures, his great tent, his painted vests, his saddles and harness, the whip his father had given him when he came to manhood, the arak he had used to slay Khal Ogo and his son, a mighty dragonbone bow. Ago would have added the weapons Drogo's blood riders had given Danny for bride gifts as well, but she forbade it. Those are mine, she told him, and I mean to keep them. Another layer of brush was piled about the Kal's treasures, and bundles of dried grass scattered over them. Sir Jor Mormont drew her aside as the sun was creeping towards its zenith. Princess, he began. Why do you call me that? Danny challenged him. My brother Viserys was your king, was he not? He was, my lady. Viserys is dead. I am his heir, the last blood of House Targaryen. Whatever was his is mine now. My queen, Sir Jorah said, going to one knee. My sword that was his is yours, Daenerys, and my heart as well. That never belonged to your brother. I am only a knight and have nothing to offer you but exile, but I beg you, hear me. Let Khal Drogo go. You shall not be alone. I promise you, no man shall take you to Vastothrak unless you wish to go. You need not join the Dash Kalim. Come east with me. E.T., Karth, the Jade Sea, Meshai by the Shadow. We will see all the wonders yet unseen, and drink what wines the gods see fit to serve us. Please, Khaleesi, I know what you intend. Do not. Do not. I must, Danny told him. She touched his face, fondly, sadly. You do not understand. I understand that you loved him. Sir Jorah said in a voice thick with despair. I loved my lady wife once, yet I did not die with her. You are my queen, my sword is yours, but do not ask me to stand aside as you climb on Drogo's pyre. I will not watch you burn. Is that what you fear? Danny kissed him lightly on his broad forehead. I am not such a child as that, sweet sir. You do not mean to die with him? You swear it, my queen? I swear it. She said in the common tongue of the seven kingdoms that by rights were hers. The third level of the platform was woven of branches no thicker than a finger, and covered with dry leaves and twigs. They laid them north to south, from ice to fire, and piled them high with soft cushions and sleeping silks. The sun had begun to lower toward the west by the time they were done. Danny called the Dothraki around her. Fewer than a hundred were left. How many had Aegon started with, she wondered. It did not matter. You will be my Kalasar, she told them. I see the faces of slaves. I free you. Take off your collars. Go if you wish. No one shall harm you. If you stay, it will be as brothers and sisters, husbands and wives. The black eyes watched her, wary, expressionless. I see the children, women, and the wrinkled faces of the aged. I was a child yesterday. Today I am a woman. Tomorrow I will be old. To each of you I say, give me your hands and your hearts, and there will always be a place for you. She turned to the three young warriors of her khas. Jogo, to you I give the silver-handled whip that was my bride gift, and name you Ko, and ask your oath, 
though you will live and die as blood of my blood, riding at my side to keep me safe from harm. Jogo took the whip from her hands, but his face was confused. Khaleesi, he said hesitantly, this is not done. It would shame me to be blood rider to a woman. Argo, Danny called, paying no heed to Jogo's words. If I look back, I am lost. To you I give the dragonbone bow that was my bride gift. It was double curved, shiny black and exquisite, taller than she was. I name you Ko, and ask your oath that you should live and die as blood of my blood, riding at my side to keep me safe from harm. Argo accepted the bow with lowered eyes. I cannot say these words. Only a man can lead a Kalasar named Ko. Rakara, Danny said, turning away from the refusal. You shall have the greater rock that was my bride gift, with hilt and blade chased in gold. And you too I name my co, and ask that you live and die as blood of my blood, riding at my side to keep me safe from harm. You are Khaleesi, Rakaro said, taking the Iraq. I shall ride at your side to Vase Dothrak beneath the Mother of Mountain, and keep you safe from harm until you take your place with the crones of the Dosh Kaleen. No more can I promise. She nodded, as calmly as if she had not heard his answer, and turned to the last of her champions. Sir Jor Mormont, she said. First and greatest of my knights, I have no bride gift to give you, but I swear to you, one day you shall have from my hands a longsword like none the world has ever seen, dragon forged and made of Valyrian steel, and I would ask for your oath as well. You have it, my queen, Sujora said, kneeling to lay his sword at her feet. I vow to serve you, to obey you, to die for you if need be. Whatever may come? Whatever may come. I shall hold you to that oath. I pray you never regret the giving of it. Danny lifted him to his feet, stretching on her toes to reach his lips. She kissed the knight gently and said, You are the first of my queen's guard. She could feel the eyes of the Kalasar on her as she entered her tent. The Dothraki were muttering and giving her strange sideways looks from the corners of their dark almond eyes. They thought her mad, Danny realized. Perhaps she was. She would know soon enough. If I look back, I am lost. Her bath was scalding hot when Eerie helped her into the tub, but Danny did not flinch or cry aloud. She liked the heat, and made her feel clean. Jiki had scented the water with the oils she had found in the market in Vestothrak. The steam rose moist and fragrant. Dorea washed her hair and combed it out, working loose the mats and tangles. Eerie scrubbed her back. Danny closed her eyes and let the smell and the warmth enfold her. She could feel the heat soaking through the soreness between her thighs. She shuddered when it entered her, and her pain and stiffness seemed to dissolve. She floated. When she was clean, her handmaids helped her from the water. Eerie and Jiki fanned her dry, while Dorea brushed her hair until it fell like a river of liquid silver down her back. They scented her with spice flower and cinnamon, a touch on each wrist, behind her ears, on the tips of her milk-heavy breasts. The last dab was for her sex. Yuri's finger felt as light and cool as a lover's kiss as it slid softly between her lips. Afterward, Danny sent them all away so she might prepare Kaldrogo for his final ride into the nightlands. She washed his body clean and brushed and oiled his hair, running her fingers through it for the last time, feeling the weight of it, remembering the first time she had touched it, the night of their wedding ride. His hair had never been cut. How many men could die with their hair uncut? She buried her face in it and inhaled the dark fragrance of the oils. He smelled like grass and warm earth, like smoke and semen and horses. He smelled like Drogo. Forgive me, son of my life, she thought. Forgive me for all I have done and all I must do. I paid the price, my star. It was too high, too high. Danny braided his hair and slid the silver rings onto his mustache and hung his bells one by one. So many bells gold and silver and bronze. Bells so his enemies would hear him coming and grow weak with fear. She dressed him in horsehair leggings and high boots, buckling a belt heavy with gold and silver medallions about his waist. Over his scarred chest she slipped a painted vest, old and faded, the one Drogo had loved best. For herself she chose loose sand silk trousers, sandals that laced halfway up her legs, and a vest like Drogo's. The sun was going down when she called them back to carry his body to the pyre. Dothraki watched in silence as Jogo and Ago bore him from the tent. Danny walked behind them. They laid him down on his cushions and silks, his head toward the Mother of Mountains far to the northeast. 
Oil, she commanded, and they brought forth the jars and poured them over the pile, soaking the silks and the brush and the bundles of dry grass, until the oil trickled from beneath the logs and the air was rich with fragrance. Bring my eggs, Danny commanded her handmaids. Something in her voice made them run. Sir Jorah took her arm. My queen, Drugger will have no use for dragon's eggs in the night lands. Better to sell them in a shy. Sell one and we can buy a ship to take us back to the free cities. Sell all three and you will be a wealthy woman all your days. They were not given to me to sell, Danny told her. She climbed the pyre herself to place the eggs around her sun and stars. The black beside his heart, under his arm. The green beside his head, his braid coiled around it. The cream and gold down between his legs. When she kissed him for the last time, Danny could taste the sweetness of the oil on his lips. As she climbed down on the pyre, she noticed Miri Mazdur watching her. You are mad, the god's wife said hoarsely. Is it so far from madness to wisdom? Danny asked. Sir Jorah, take this magi and bind her to the pyre. To the... My queen, no, hear me. Do as I say. Still he hesitated, until her anger flared. You swore to obey me, whatever might come. Bokara, help him. The god's wife did not cry out as they dragged her to Caldrogo's pyre and staked her down amidst his treasures. Danny poured the oil over the woman's head herself. I thank you, Miri Master, she said, for the lessons you have taught me. You will not hear me scream, Miri responded as the oil dripped from her hair and soaked her clothing. I will, Danny said, but it is not your screams I want, only your life. I remember what you told me. Only death can pay for life. Mira Mazdur opened her mouth, but made no reply. As she stepped away, Danny saw that the contempt was gone from the Magi's flat black eyes. In its place was something that might have been fear. Then there was nothing to be done but watch the sun and look for the first star. When a horse lord dies, his horse is slain with him, so he might ride proud into the nightlands. The bodies are burned beneath the open sky, and the call rises on his fiery steed to take his place among the stars. The more fiercely the man burned in life, the brighter his star will shine in the darkness. Jogo spied it first. There, he said in a hushed voice. Denny looked and saw it, low in the east. The first star was a comet, burning red, blood red, fire red, the dragon's tail. She could not have asked for a stronger sign. Danny took the torch from Ago's hand and thrust it between the logs. The oil took the fire at once, the brush and dried grass a heartbeat later. Tiny flames went darting up the wood like swift red mice, skating over the oil and leaping back from bark to branch to leaf. A rising heat puffed at her face, soft and sudden as a lover's breath, but in seconds it had grown too hot to bear. Danny stepped backward. The wood crackled, louder and louder. Miri Mazdur began to sing in a shrill, oilating voice. The flames whirled and writhed, racing each other up the platform. The dusk shimmered as the air itself seemed to liquefy from the heat. Danny heard logs spit and crack. The fire swept over Miri Mazdur. Her song grew louder, shriller. Then she gasped again and again, and her song became a shuddering wail, thin and high and full of agony. And now the flames reached her Jiroko. And now they were all around him. His clothing took fire, and for an instant, the call was clad in wisps of floating orange silk and tendrils of curling smoke, gray and greasy. Danny's lips parted, and she found herself holding her breath. Part of her wanted to go to him, as Sir Jorah had feared, to rush into the flames to beg for his forgiveness and take him inside her one last time, the fire melting the flesh from their bones until there was one, forever. She could smell the odor of burning flesh, no different than horse flesh roasting in a fire pit. The pyre roared in the deepening dusk like some great beast, drowning out the fainter sound of Miri Mazdur's screaming and sending up long tongues of flame to lick at the belly of the night. As the smoke grew thicker, the Dothraki backed away, coughing. Huge orange gouts of fire unfurled their banners in that hellish wind, the logs hissing and cracking, glowing cinders rising on the smoke to float away into the dark like so many newborn fireflies. The heat beat at the air with great red wings, driving the Dothraki back, driving off even Mormont, but Danny stood her ground. She was the blood of the dragon, and the fire was in her. She had sensed the truth of it long ago, Danny thought as she took a step closer to the conflagration, but the brazier had not been hot enough. 
The flames writhed before her like the woman who had danced at her wedding, whirling and singing and spinning their yellow and orange and crimson veils, fearsome to behold, yet lovely, so lovely, alive with heat. Denny opened her arms to them, her skin flushed and glowing. This is a wedding, too, she thought. Miriam Astor had fallen silent. The god's wife thought her a child, but children grow, and children learn. Another step, and Danny could feel the heat of the sand on the soles of her feet, even through her sandals. Sweat ran down her thighs, and between her breasts and rivulets over her cheeks, where tears had once run, Sir Jorah was shouting behind her. But it did not matter any more. Only the fire mattered. The flames were so beautiful, the loveliest things she had ever seen, each one a sorcerer robed in yellow and orange and scarlet, swirling long, smoky cloaks. She saw crimson firelight and great yellow serpents and unicorns made a pale blue flame. She saw fish and foxes and monsters, wolves and bright birds and flowering trees, each more beautiful than the last. She saw a horse, a great gray stallion limbed in smoke, its flowing mane and nimbus of blue flame. Yes, my love, my sun and stars. Yes, mount now, ride now. Her vest had begun to smolder, so Danny shrugged it off and let it fall to the ground. The painted leather burst into sudden flame as she skipped closer to the fire, her breast bare to the blaze, streams of milk flowing from her red and swollen nipples. Now, she thought, now! And for an instant she glimpsed Khal Drogo before her, mounted on his smoky stallion, a flaming lash in his hair. He smiled, and the whip snaked down at the pyre, hissing. She heard a crack, the sound of shattering stone. The platform of wood and brush and grass began to shift and collapse in upon itself, Bits of burning wood slid down at her, and Danny was showered with ash and cinders. And something else came crashing down, bouncing and rolling to land at her feet. A chunk of curved rock, pale and vain, with gold broken and smoking. The roaring filled the world, yet dimly through the firefall Danny heard women shriek and children cry out in wonder. Only death can pay for life. And there came a second crack loud and sharp as thunder, and the smoke stirred and whirled around her and the pyre shifted, the logs exploding as the fire touched their secret hearts. She heard the screams of frightened horses, and the voices of the Dothraki raised in shouts of fear and terror, and Sir Jorah calling her name and cursing. No, she went to shout to him. No, my good knight, do not fear for me. The fire is mine. I am Daenerys Stormborn, daughter of dragons, bride of dragons, mother of dragons. Don't you see? Don't you see? With a belch of flame and smoke that reached thirty feet into the sky, the pyre collapsed and came down around her. Unafraid, Danny stepped forward into the firestorm, calling to her children. The third crack was as loud and sharp as the breaking of the world. When the fire died at last and the ground became cool enough to walk upon, Sir Jor Mormont found her amidst the ashes, surrounded by blackened logs and bits of glowing ember and the burnt bones of man and woman and stallion. She was naked, covered with soot, her clothes turned to ash, her beautiful hair all crisped away, and she was unhurt. The cream and gold dragon was suckling at her left breast, the green and bronze at the right. Her arms cradled them close. The black and scarlet beast was draped across her shoulders, its long, sinuous neck coiled under her chin. When it saw Jorah, it raised its head and looked at him with eyes as red as coals. Wordless, the knight fell to his knees. The men of her cost came up behind him. Jogo was the first to lay his arak at her feet. Blood of my blood, he murmured, pushing his face to the smoking earth. Blood of my blood, she heard Argo echo. Blood of my blood, Rakaro shouted. And after them came her handmaids, and then the others all the Dothraki, men and women and children, and Danny had only to look at their eyes to know that they were hers now, today and tomorrow and forever, hers as they had never been Drogo's. As Daenerys Targaryen rose to her feet, her black hissed, pale smoke venting from its mouth and nostrils. The other two pulled away from her breasts and added their voices to the call, translucent wings unfolding and stirring the air, and for the first time in hundreds of years, the night came alive with the music of dragons.